Okay, hello everybody, welcome to the fourth panel of the Davis Institute uh, Conference. Uh, yes. And my name is Leo Lers, I'm from the Davis Institute, and next month I'm joining the faculty of the IR department in the Hebrew University. And, to, and to, during the day we, had, we heard insightful discussion about the liberal international order from different angles. What we are going to do in this panel, we are going to talk about Israel, the elephant in the room, and the role of Israel in this debate and in this context, and about the relationship between the liberal international order and Israel, and also the illiberal actors maybe who try to challenge the liberal order. I can say already that what's been interesting to see in recent years, and especially in recent months, is the role of Israel in the transnational coalition, a network that you can see in this debate of illiberal, illiberal order. We saw a Netanyahu partnership with Trump, with Bolsonaro, with, uh, with Hungary, and now we see the civil society in Israel cooperating and consulting with the civil society in Turkey, in Hungary, in Poland, even participating in the demonstrations, so this is very interesting. And this is the basis for a, a discussion today. And we gather here the four distinguished experts exactly for this question, to explore this question. A, a Professor Arya Khan from the Academic uh, College of Tel Aviv, uh, Yafo. And um, Moro Mitterani from the University of Bar-Ilan. I will introduce them more, uh, la more later. Michael Barnett from George Washington University. And I'm Chaim again from Reichman uh, University. And I would just like to mention that the discussion will be based actually on four main questions that you can see actually right here. And that will be the basis for our discussion. I will just, uh, I will just go over it. So the, the main question is how the liberal international order has impacted political, economic, or normative development in Israel. And how the growing international illiberal trend making an impact on Israel. This is also relevant to the question of the transnational cooperation. How Israel is either influencing or challenging the liberal international order, and here it's also related, you just saw it so we are from the window, it's to the conflict and how the impact of the conflict with the Palestinian is connected to that, and how Israel views itself within this order. Now we have here uh, four uh, speakers, each of you will have 15 minutes, and then uh, Tal will give you an illiberal reminder when you have two minutes left uh, before the end, and I will introduce each of you separately. Uh, so the first one will be uh, Dr. Amichai um, again is a senior lecturer, head of the MA program in diplomacy and conflict studies and director of the program on democratic resilience and development at the Lauder School of Government, Diplomacy and Strategy at Reichmann University. His research and teaching interests include political orders, democracy, the rule of law, risks and political violence. And thank you. Okay. So, good afternoon. Um everybody and uh, once again huge congratulations uh, to Galia and the team for putting this wonderful set of conversations together. Um, I actually want to do a couple of rather different things. Let me just say something very briefly about the theme of this particular uh, panel uh, about Israel just to lay a few uh, thoughts on the table uh, very very briefly and then we can pick this up in, in Q&A. Um, so just three, three points really about Israel and the liberal international order. One is that Israel was born into, uh, modern Israel was born into the liberal international order in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. So we didn't really know what it was like before. <laughs> and that, that is, that is our, that's our modern historical experience. And as historical experiences go, we have not only survived, but we've also thrived within the liberal international uh, order. Uh, my conception of the, of the international order, just very, very fundamentally, and something that I mentioned earlier uh, today, is really two-layered. When I talk to my students about the liberal international order, I talk about a double-layered cake, and you can choose whether it's a cheesecake or a chocolate cake or whatever. I'm rather enamored with the idea of the liberal international order. It's a two-layered system. One layer is the Westphalian layer, the base layer, which as I said uh, earlier uh, today, was not replaced by the post-Second World War liberal international order. So it was actually uh, universalized uh, and, uh, and, and, and affirmed. So we have a base layer of Westphalian rules and principles, and we've, that Westphalian layer is now being contested as well, as we can see um, with the violation of fundamental norms of territorial integrity and so on and so forth. 
but then there's also a sort of a Wilsonian triangle that's built on top of the base Westphalian layer, which we might call the liberal layer or the Wilsonian uh, uh, layer, uh, which for me is composed of three pillars. One is um, the spread of uh, uh, liberal uh, political values and institutions in the international system. The second is economic liberalism, free trade, investment, uh, innovation, entrepreneurship. And then the third is th this idea of a rules-based international order, international law and international institutions. And I think it's fair to, to say that Israel has a rather schizophrenic relationship with the liberal international order if we consider those four dimensions of uh, liberal international order, right? So modern statehood, Israel has um, is sort of the basis of modern Zionism, right? The 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 the, um, uh, the dream of or the political manifestation of modern Zionism is the realization of effective modern uh, sovereign uh, sovereign statehood, and in that respect, Israel took to this uh, base idea um, uh, enthusiastically and has uh, done rather well when you look at indicators of state capacity, for example, Israel is still considered a rather strong state, although, <laughs> as we can see uh, right now, uh, what's going on in the Golan and other parts of, of, of the country, uh, increasingly Israelis are worried about state capacity, about governance, and about Israel developing what I like to call areas of limited statehood, where the statehood uh, and sovereignty dimensions of uh, modern liberal order are being challenged and being undermined. Um, Israel also has a rather uncomplicated relationship, I think, with free trade and, uh, and, and, and uh, global economic openness. We've done very well out of it. Where we have a much more complicated relationship, I think, is with the rules-based international uh, order and the international uh, rule of law for obvious, uh, obvious uh, reasons. And we have a rather complicated, uh, ambiguous relationship with the idea of the spread of democracy in the international system. Uh, and maybe I'll just leave it, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I was, the, the third and last point I'll make about this, um, interestingly enough, enough converses with the conversation we had about China. Um, um, and, and when I was listening to, to the panel about China, one of the points that you, Professor, raised about China is the duality of chi uh, Chinese conception of order um, as sort of a distinction that is, that is made certainly in, in uh, uh, pre-modern uh, Chinese thinking about uh, political order um, that is bifurcated, a Chinese um, relationship with the Confucian world uh, of sort of a more civilized, uh, legalized, legalistic type of interactions and then a Chinese interaction with what were considered the barbarian states that, are, that were outside of the Confucian uh, world, right? It, correct me if I'm wrong, but in essence, uh, historically, China thought about uh, Korea, Vietnam, and in some respects, Japan as being part of this kind of more civilized Confucian type of world, and then the peoples of the steppes were sort of the, the, the barbarians. That duality, and this is something we haven't really spoken about yet, of international order actually not, is, not, is not necessarily unitary. Um, but different international actors actually practice different international orders um, with different parts of the world. And I think that's also very true for Israel. I think that the way that Israel interacts with the West uh, is very, very different from the way that Israel interacts, uh, at least historically, with uh, its immediate neighbors and, and sort of second and third uh, order neighbors in uh, the Middle East um, and, and beyond. So that's all I want to say about, uh, about, about Israel. How am I doing for time? Do I still have a few more minutes? Great, okay. So now I'll turn to what I really wanted to talk about. And this is based on, um, uh, on an article I published uh, about two years ago on the new search for eunomia. This is eunomia, that beautiful lady over there. Eunomia is the Greek goddess of good order or living in a state governed by good laws. And eunomia reminds us that the human quest for political order is ancient and ongoing. And in fact, it is ubiquitous. Um, a number of very, very brief, uh, brief points. Uh, liberal political orders, whether they are domestic, regional, or international, are subcategories or species within a broader taxonomy of, uh, uh, of political, political orders. This is an almost trite point, but I think it's very, very important 
for us to remember that there is nothing magical about liberal orders. There's nothing, we have to be very careful about the assumption that somehow uh, a liberal political order will succeed just by virtue of the fact that it is, that we perceive it as being somehow normatively uh, superior. My point here is that in order to survive and thrive all, over time, liberal orders have to fulfill all of the constitutive elements that make for a viable political order, whether, whether it is liberal or not. Okay? So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a basic point, but I think it's, a, it's, it's an important one and one that we, we often um, make mistakes over. My thinking about political orders is that uh, they are essentially um, attempted human solution structures to the fundamental human need for physical and ontological security. And they combine four constitutive elements, uh, many of whom we've already uh, addressed earlier today, rules and arrangements, power ultimately backed by coercive force, the need for legitimacy, we spoke about input legitimacy, output legitimacy, I would also add a fourth constitutive element, which I think is shared by every form of political order, and that is what I might call an ontological narrative or story of being. Every political order tells a story about itself. Where did it come from? Where is it now? And where might it be going? And once, we, and once the ontological narrative becomes deeply contested, I think this is a point that Alex made uh, earlier, uh, and we see within our societies, once elites in particular no longer share a cohesive ontological narrative, the political order uh, is, is, is undermined, not from outside, but from, from, from within. Okay? And of course, each one of these elements uh, interact with one another. When you have a high degree of legitimacy, you don't have to use so much coercive power. When you have a high degree of legitimacy, you can change rules and arrangements more by consensus than by coercion, right? So there is that, there is that vital interaction. Like Immanuel Adler, I believe that political orders are subject to uh, competitive selection. Um, and that to thrive over time, liberal orders must outperform their competitors, either the illiberal or anti-liberal uh, uh, competitors. In fact, I think about our contemporary liberal orders as being the outcome of a repeated process of, histori of modern historical competition between liberal and anti-liberal solution structures in which the liberal solution structure eventually defeated the, uh, the competitor. So in the 17th century, religious toleration eventually won over religious uh, dogma. It took a lot of blood and it took about two, two centuries, but eventually, and the, you know, the Dutch Republic is critical here and the English uh, uh, are critical here, but eventually elites in Europe realized that by adopting the values of religious toleration, which are really the fundamental values that give us human rights and, civil and, and modern civil and political rights, by adopting those values and those institutions that guarantee those values, not only were they going to be uh, spared the scourge of, of war, but their, their militaries, their economies, um, are going to, we're, we're gonna do better than the, than the alternative. Um, in the 18th and 19th century, gradually Republican government, by which I mean limited government, right? Lockean limited government, gradually outperformed absolutism, and so elites opted for limited government over absolutism. And in the 20th century, market-based liberal democracy, and then its international manifestations of what we call Wilsonian or liberal international order, eventually outperformed the fascist communist uh, competitors to uh, market-based liberal uh, democracy. So liberalism won in the modern era, not because it was morally superior, but because it produced superior solution structures to the great challenges of the era in terms of economic, uh, political, military uh, uh, power. Uh, this also points us to uh, a very profound idea in liberalism, which we associate with Montesquieu, but more recently with Judith Schlar, and that is the idea of the liberalism of fear. I think it was Michael Barnett who mentioned that perhaps in the 21st century our goal should be to minimize the worst rather than to try to seek, to seek for, some, for some utopia. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish. So, if we, if we look towards tomorrow's discussion and, and beyond, my, my argument would be that in the 21st century we are once again 
uh, facing uh, an historical moment of um, grand order uh, contestation. <coughs> And if we want the future to be liberal, liberalism has to reinvent itself once again so that it provides superior solution structures to the great fears of our age. That is climate, AI, synthetic biology, pandemics, all of those, all of those uh, challenges. And so our goal as thinkers and as uh, policy people should be to work very, in a very, very concerted way on trying to figure out how do we generate solution structures to the great fears of our age that also fulfill uh, fundamental uh, liberal uh, values and principles. So I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you very much.
This is what the probability that the state will speak about development when it speaks in the United Nations General Assembly. This is all of the states. This is as well. And this is what, 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 are, what is the probability that the state will speak about nuclear proliferation when it speaks in the United Nations General Assembly. This is all of the states. This is Israel. And the same thing happened in our second project that looks on the semantic uh, similarity between state speeches in the United Nations and the, UN, and the UN Charter. So we measure to what extent state speeches echo the UN Charter. These are the states. It, it runs between 50 to 90% of similarity. This is Israel. And, our, and the last graph I want to show you, it's a bit scary, don't get uh, spooked. Uh, measure similarities between state speeches themselves. I won't get into too many details, it's not that important, but basically the green line is the average speech. So what is the distance between any state and the average speech in the United Nations General Assembly? This is Israel. Israel has the most exclusionist, isolationist discourse in the United Nations, and it is the state, uh, it's the second state, Actually, South Sudan is the first state, but we don't consider South Sudan because it's a new state to the United Nations. But Israel is the state that its speeches in the United, General, in the, in the United Nations General Assembly is the least, the most distanced from any other state. Okay, and so nothing in my original project was supposed to be around Israel, but then, based on these examples, uh, all this realization kind of boosted another side project that I'm going to discuss in show today and ask two questions. One, theoretical, what makes an outlier in IR? Second, which is more empirical, examines Israel as an outlier, specifically how Israel communicates its whole identity as an outlier. And the main claim I wish, I wish to make is that Israel plays the role of an outlier in the liberal international order, actively and intentionally positioning itself on the margins rather than aligning with the majority. And this claim rests on two underlying analytical premises. First, states are agents that operate within the international sphere that is ordered since World War II, and especially since the end of the Cold War, by liberal values and norms in what we term LIO. The liberal component of LIO manifest in economic, political, and institutional aspect, we spoke about it earlier, and it informs not only state international conduct, but also the standard of legitimacy in the international sphere. In our broader project, based on these premises, uh, we take a social discourse approach and explore how state experience a uh, LIO, narrate it, and discourse position themselves within this order. We also examine how state justify their position, how they frame their interactions and relations with other states, and how this position further projects on the on their conduct in, in the international world. <coughs> the main theoretical argument is that the very notion of international order creates a notion of a we, to which agents see themselves as part of the collective. The collective informs the array of expected and accepted rules of conduct, as well as the institutional framework in which these rules practically operate. Agents are required to publicly position themselves against this imagined collective and this and end and are expected to act in accordance with the social position. Our empirical findings identified four main positions. We have states that are influencers, followers, opposers, and outliers. Today I wish to focus on those who choose not to follow trends, but also not attempt to make new trends, the outliers. The particular case study is Israel, and as I showed in the graphs, uh, Israel consists consistently position itself as an outlier regardless of issues, areas, or other contexts to the extent of adopting the whole identity of the outlier as a core component of its state's identity. This position, I claim, although resonating with Israel's national biography, contradicts the vision of Israel as a democratic and liberal state and as a vibrant member of the international, of the international community. It also perpetuates Israel's exclusionist image, making it an easy target for criticism and highlighting
closely linked to its national biography and serves a prominent aspect in its particular individual identity as a state. A state that was established in the aftermath of the catastrophic genocide of its people and had coped since inception with security threats by all of its surrounding neighbors. Israel's national past, therefore, entails what is often dubbed as a siege mentality. Portraying Israel as a state that its ontological security revolves around anxiety and mistrust. A state that hails self help as a vital part of its identity and treat collective and communal aspect of the international sphere with great suspicion, often avoiding international arrangements that involve high level of compliance or monitoring. However, in 1948, when Israel was established, it expressed its vision for the future, marking itself as both a Jewish state and a democratic state. By, by aligning itself with the community of democratic nations, Israel aims to be acknowledged as a legitimate member of the LIO, consequently invest great effort in depicting itself as a normal state according to the standards set, set by the LIO. Israel often emphasized its adherence to liberal democracy and its status as a thriving economically developed nation with a strong startup culture. And this is the paradox. Israel grappled with significant internal struggle due to its inherent incompatibility between its two identity components. It results in a sense of divided personality. So Amichai spoke about schizophrenia and I call it divided personality. The tension between the Jewish and democratic aspect representing a clash between the past and the future has been a major contributor to the political instability experienced in the recent years and a major contributor to, uh, to the escalation in the growing inter internal confrontation in recent months. But this tension has long ago and consistently shaped Israel's international world identity over the past few decades, revealing the nation's complex and conflicting stance toward the Lion. To some extent, the notion of the Lion serves Israel as a strategic tool. Israel places great emphasis on highlighting its normality and legitimacy, particularly in the context of Lion, in order to counter its enemies. By actively seeking international validation as it aims to maintain its status as a member of the esteemed group of good liberal states. So just a few anecdotal examples. Israel takes pride in its membership in the OECD since 2010, showcasing its economic appeal as a hub for technological research and development, as, a, as well as high-tech investment. It also promotes its commitment to <coughs> liberal rights, exemplified by the vibrant LGBT, LG, LGBT scene in Tel Aviv, or its effort toward gender equality in its compulsory military service. Even in the sensitive realm of military and defense, Israel often <coughs> underscores notions of morality, international law, and human rights in order to justify its military actions and political decisions in the framework of self-defense, portraying itself and its army as just, reasonable, and moral. These efforts are aimed at maintaining the perception of Israel as a normal state, conforming to the liberal and democratic standards of the lion, thereby distinguishing itself from its illiberal actions. However, and it is important to note that much of the Israel discourse, as, we, as I showed in the, in the graph, is defensive in nature. Instead of simply presenting itself as any other liberal, uh, liberal democratic state, it engages in discussion about why it should be recognized as such, highlighting its unique challenges and characteristics that further emphasize its position as, a, as an excluded state. But now, so the case I want to make at the end of the discussion is that eventually, is that eventually Israel is not a unique case, but rather the exemplar of the internal movement between the two faces of state identity. On the one hand, there is the individual national identity, while on the other hand, there exists an international identity manifested in the stance toward the collective real states. The, instant, the intensity of this tension determines the magnitude of the pendulum, uh, particularly in states like Israel that are still in the process of solid, solid, uh, consolidating the sovereignty of state. Hungary and Poland serve as additional exemplars of outliers, both in recent years as positioned themselves as outliers to the liberal European order, navigating between inclusion and, inclu and exclusion from a liberal regional project. The United Kingdom departure from the EU and Donald Trump's Make America Great Again campaign and policies further illustrate this inherent conflict between international liberalism and the desire to safeguard 
sovereignty and nationalism. That in a broader context, the counter rupture of the liberal international order can be viewed as a critical juncture in where states must reassess the social spending on the global stage and make choices regarding the, regarding the priorities of liberalism versus sovereignty and nationalism. This involves not only determining which values are the most important, but also weighing, weighing the cost associated with uh, moving away liberalism in the name of defending national values. Thank you. Thank you, more. I think that in Israel's speeches, they always one using also posters and photos in the speech in the UN. What? It's yes. also a. We like it. It's also unique. Okay, thank you, Vomo. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Arya Kamp. Uh, yeah, we can close it. Arya is an associate professor for political economy and international relations at the Academic College of Tel Aviv, Yafo. His fields of study are comparative political economy and international political economy. Recently, he focuses on the interaction between economy and geopolitics in the case of Israel. Uh, Arya is also the head of the interdisciplinary program for philosophy, political science, and economics, and is also the chair of the forum for money, banking, and credit of the Israeli Association for Economic History. Thank you very much. about what I call the 
Zionism, uh, post Zionism, and neo Zionism, which uh, define the, I would say, the national vision during the formation of the state from the 50s to the 70s, then we have post Zionism around the 90s, and after the 2000s, a kind of re emergence of uh, neo Zionism. So what interests me is, is the interaction between the three phases here and the three phases there. So in the first phase, the formation of Israel and the interaction with the Bretton Woods uh, uh, period, of course, during the Cold War, etc. So I, I think that in this period we can see kind of, despite the, I would say, the internal contradiction. Uh, within the Israeli national effort between uh, Jewishness and democracy. Uh, I, I think Israel was, for, for Israel, the, the ILO was a kind of opportunity in the way the ILO created Israel. First, uh, in the sense of the uh, proliferation of the idea of self-determination and post-colonialism, obviously, I think uh, this is well known. And of course, I, I think uh, Amichai and Moore talked about that this schizophrenic uh, uh, and duality, etc. Uh, so, but, but it seems to it that, that this schizophrenic position characterized also the Israeli national purpose and the international imperial order at that sense. And there was obviously a, 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 a conflict, contradiction between the notion of a state autonomy and sovereignty on the one hand, and on the other hand, this being part of the community. But I, again, I, I think this internal contradiction is part of the international liberal order. I don't think it is, uh, it, it is a threat to the liberal order. Now, a second element in this period was the financial support that Israel received from Western economies, from Western partners, just from Germany and from the United States. Basically, so even when it was from Germany, <coughs> Germany was only a broker of the money came from the United States. In, in a way, it was a Western support to Israel. And again, I say, although uh, the support to Israel had some unique features, it was part of a general trend in the Bretton Woods. I mean, Israel was is not the only country that uh, received financial support from uh, the West. And there was also the military support that Israel received from the West. So to some, to a large degree, I think we can agree that Israel was a kind of a creation of the international liberal order during the first phase. Uh, the national identity of Israel was shaped in relation to uh, liberal democratic values on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the uh, nationalistic and, and uh, super, the importance of sovereignty, etc. And also we have to remember that the fact, you know, Israel's concern about its sovereignty was, uh, uh, went well with the uh, United States' concern about uh, the rise of communism and what they also uh, uh, collaborated on this basis during the 70s. Now, now I move to the 80s. The 80s were kind of a, a transition period um, and I think in this, during the 80s the international liberal order went through some very uh, radical changes. Uh, first, uh, I, I think that the, for Israel, it was important that uh, the United States started to establish itself, it established its credibility as a fair broker in the Middle East, rather than, than using Israel as a strategic asset against the uh, expansion of communism, and, and this had a very important impact on Israel. Then we had the energy crisis in the inflation crisis uh, around the world, which also affected the willingness of the United States to support uh, Israel, and the war on inflation 
in the United States caused uh, the increasing of the interest rates uh, in the United States caused a, a, a wave of global uh, of the debt crisis in the global south, which all these uh, events revealed some vulnerabilities in the international liberal order, which uh, affected to some extent Israel, but I, I won't expand, uh, expand on that, but to those of you who know, there was this uh, 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 economic uh, plan in 85 that really transformed Israel, but I will not talk about it here. Now, the, the more interesting thing is in the second phase, uh, in the 90s, uh, during the period of, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And here we had, on the one hand, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, which obviously transformed the international liberal order and uh, uh, brought us into the era of globalization, the end of history, etc. And on the side of Israel, it uh, changed the Israeli national purpose uh, in the sense that we saw the emergence of the uh, peace economy and the starting of the, the attempt to reach territorial compromise uh, in uh, Israel. So here what we, we saw a kind of uh, combination between the rise of post-Zionism in Israel and the end of history around the world, and it was a kind of, I would say, a second honeymoon between Israel and the international liberal order, because it seems that the, the, uh, the, uh, the path of Israel is to be combined with the, uh, uh, the new type of international liberal order. Now, the, the interesting point is, I think, when towards during the 90s, we already we, we could see that the idea of Israel being part of the West and <coughs> the international liberal order became a political issue because uh, the, at that point, the, uh, the left wing parties in Israel saw an, opportun an opportunity in the new type of uh, in globalization and the new type of international liberal order, but the right wing started to look at it as a threat. And this brought us to the third phase of the uh, relationship between Israel and the international uh, liberal order. Now, what happened here is that on the one hand, uh, after 2000, the international liberal order uh, confronted several events that undermined it, and I would mention a few of them, which uh, other speakers mentioned before. The Asian crisis in the end of the 90s, the 9-11, the global financial crisis in 2008, the Eurozone, cri Eurozone crisis in 2010, uh, and then the intervention of Russia in Syria. Now, all those events undermine the influence of the international liberal order and they created the uh, impression that Israel cannot rely on it anymore. On the Israeli side, uh, after Camp David uh, and the outbreak of the Second Intifada and the rise to power of the right-wing parties, the common conception was that Israel should develop itself away from the West uh, and that the international liberal order in its old form uh, did not serve Israel interest anymore. So I think from that point on, from the early 2000s until recently, there was a kind of divergence between the Israeli national purpose and, and the international liberal order in its old form. And at the same time, as other people said here, that uh, during this period, the, a new order emerged, a kind of illiberal order, which the right
right wing parties in Israel, the, the right wing government, try to pull Israel towards this uh, uh, direction. Now, just for one minute, I, I want to talk about the uh, recent year and the event that we are going, uh, uh, the, the events in Israel regarding the constitutional court. Actually, but, uh, what we saw is that after the Ukraine crisis, there was a kind of revival of the uh, international liberal order, but Israel resisted, uh, the, right, the Israeli right wing party resisted taking part of it, and you know it has to be cautious to maintain good relationship with China and with India, and yeah, yeah, just one minute. Uh, and, uh, 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 and you know, Netanyahu made a lot of effort to nurture the relationship with the illiberal uh, regime. And in that sense, what I think that the point that currently, I think a lot of uh, the division between the two camps in Israel, the supporters of the group and those who are against it, this is basically a conflict about whether Israel is still part of the international liberal order or that is going to the other uh, uh, direction. I think beneath everything is, well, on the surface, this is about democracy, this is about the rules. But if you think about it, those rules, where did they come from? Those rules came from the international liberal order. And this is what is contested. Uh, uh, in the recent half year. This is about whether Israel is going to be part to maintain its position, its national identity as being part of this uh, uh, international liberal order or that it is going to side with other countries which are illiberal, you know, China, Russia, they are all, uh, I think, this is the, uh, what is the state. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Arya. This is a good reminder why this is a critical moment to have this discussion here in Jerusalem. And uh, our fourth uh, panelist is uh, Professor Michael Barnett, a uh, university professor of international affairs and political science at George, University, uh, George Washington University. Daniel mentioned that you had a lot of uh, publication. I'll just remind again that our last publication, recent book, is the coordinated book, one State Reality, What is Israel? Palestine, published quite recently by Cornell University Press, very relevant also for our discussion. Thank you. For Thank you. So, I'd like to say I'm happy to be on this panel. That'd be kind of a lie. Um, I, you know, how am I different from everybody else? I'm an American. Uh, and so, in the United States, we often begin our presentations by, you know, presenting our subject position. Uh, and so I'm not just an American, I'm an old white American uh, male. Uh, I'm also a Jewish American, and not just any Jewish American. I grew up in the Midwest, which meant I was a deracinated Jew. Uh, and the only time I began to discover my Jewish identity was when I wrapped my arms around the Holocaust in Israel. So that makes me in many ways prototypical of, let's say, a, a generation of Jewish Americans, which will become relevant. And, you know, and part of it is to explain, you know, in many ways, I'm deeply uncomfortable being on a panel, you know, talking about Israel, because I actually, you know, I listen to Avram Sela, and he's right, I should be listening, not talking. Um, and so I really enjoy the, the three pre previous presentations and listening to what they said. And I also want to just point out, and I'll come back to this, what they didn't say. I don't think a single person mentioned the occupation. Huh? Okay, fine. I think that's quite interesting. For me, that's the central issue that confronts Israel in the relationship to the liberal international order, and yet 
very different view of Israel in relationship to the West and the liberal international order. My view is that it's always had a liberal relationship. It's always been, as I thought in the talk, betwixt and between. It's never been one or the other. It's always been somewhere in, in the grays. And, you know, my, my interpretation of the first two decades of Israel's history is that it occupied something of a no man's land. Uh, that, you know, when Israel first was born, it thought it was going to have a socialist orientation. It wasn't necessarily grabbed. The West did not necessarily, right, embrace Israel. There was the lingering guilt about the Holocaust. But, you know, Europe, except for Germany and the reparations, which I know had its own, you know, sort of controversy, uh, Europe and, and the U.S. kept Israel at arm's length. They were much more interested in courting Arab states in its containment policy than it was in embracing Israel. Uh, and, you know, in America, you know, I think it was Dulles who asked, you know, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister to think about surrendering the Negev to Egypt so that it could have a land bridge to Jordan and fulfill pan-Arab designs. Okay, so I'm not sure that, you know, I don't think that while Israel may have thought about itself as part of a liberal international order that I actually don't think existed back then, but in addition, I don't think the liberal international order even thought about Israel as a potential member. Um, there was also the Israel that was born uh, with a Jewish identity. That means something. It's supposed to be a Jewish state or a state of the Jews. That means fundamentally there's an ethno-national component to it and a religious component to it. The consequence then is that its relationship to liberalism is, you know, highly, let's just say, complex. Uh, one of my favorite books about Israel is by Israel by his Rocky, Professor Rocky rubber bullets, in which, as I remember it, he makes a very compelling case why individualism has a difficult time taking root in Israel. Liberalism, as he wrote about it, you know, didn't have, let's say, this was not fertile ground, because you're surrounded by forms of collectivism and communitarianism. The individual comes second to the community. Um, situation began to change after 1967, where increasingly you began to see Israel embraced by the U.S. and the West, not because necessarily Israel, oh, there's a liberal democratic state, but rather because of security considerations, primarily, and Vietnam. And, you know, and then you begin to have the special relationship in which you now have the invention of shared values and bonds. American presidents and foreign policy leaders didn't talk about, in, in, in the kind of detail, these shared values before 1967. They are a post-67 uh, development. Europe also began to follow suit, although I would argue it less to do with liberalism and much to do with guilt over the Holocaust. By the way, apparently Samuel Huntington didn't get the memo. Because when he talked about civilizations, he omitted Israel, and as he later explained, it doesn't work. The West is Christian. Israel's not. So it's not going to fit. And so, you know, which is a very controversial statement, but it also reminds us of something we haven't really talked about, which is whether the liberal international order is a Christian international order. Just to put another provocation out there. The 1990s, what's that? What about Japan? What about Japan? Japan is a key member of the liberal international I wasn't aware that we were allowed to tackle. But we can talk about this later. Okay. 1990s is when I think, you know, and I think we're in agreement here, Israel becomes more fully, more, more fully uh, ensconced in the liberal international order. I was, as I mentioned, I was teaching at Hebrew University at the time of, of the Shamir Ravine campaign, and I remember distinctly, 
made money on a campaign that was, are we going to look to the future and the West or to the past? And that we have to look to the future. It was a, in many ways, it was, it, for, to these ears, uh, it was over this question of Israel relationship to the West. You've got to make a choice. Uh, Israel becomes increasingly associated with many of the Western clubs. It's allowed into the club of Europe. Uh, at the UN, but don't ever try to get a seat. Uh, you can vote, but you don't get a seat. Uh, but in, it, in many ways, it becomes uh, really, I think, very much part of the institutions of the liberal international order in new ways. And maybe not a full member, maybe a provisional member, but it's there. It's part of the conversation. That was then. What do we have now? Well, you tell me. I'll just tell you what I see. I, I don't see an Israel that fits very well with a liberal polity. Religious freedom? Got news for you. Israel ranks in the bottom half of surveys on religious freedom. Bottom half. And you don't need to actually you know, make that point too emphatically with Jewish Americans who kind of know that their reform and conservative values, Jewish perspectives are not quite welcomed by the religious authorities. Liberalism, you know, we all know what's happening. You know, the basic law, 2018, that's just, you know, part of a longstanding trend. These are ways in which discrimination is increasingly built into law. I suspect there's a relationship to the demo demographic shift where increasingly Jews are either, you know, unparalleled or even maybe losing their population advantage over Arabs, so, you know, a lot of anxiety, so you've got to ensconce uh, the superiority of Jews over non-Jews. Uh, these are systems of exclusion, clearly. Democracy within the green line. Not anywhere else. So, you know, and, and I've written, you know, with others about this one state reality. Assuming that Israel is a one state reality, you know, it's not a liberal state. It, it just doesn't match up. Um, and, you know, I agree, my, my impression that Israel is reorient, reoriented itself around from Western alliances for good reasons, and is finding, you know, comfort with Hungary, Poland, even if it means turning its eye to their involvement in the Holocaust. This, this is a, you know, I, I never thought I would live long enough to see this. So I think Israel might be shedding its qualities that are supposed to be a condition for membership in the LIO. Does that mean that Israel will be served an eviction notice? I doubt it. But, but that's because of, of various forms of politics. The question I want to, how much time do I have before you start throwing uh, things? Okay. Four Wait. <laughs> No, I'm going to stick with five. Your first answer was right. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll, just I know. What am I doing? Well, actually, can I get back to the part where Benny interrupted? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So, here's another litmus test for me, which is I always, you know, I think of the liberal international order as aspirational. Is this something you want to become? It's not that you've done it or you crossed the finish line. It's that it becomes the lodestar. It directs you. It tells you whether you are on the right track or how far you deviated. This is a debate right now in the United States. My question to those in the room and the other panelists is, is it still aspirational in Israel? Certainly for... A, a very strong population.
vocalist and vocal group. But I don't. But I think it's weakening. I think that's part of the, as you say, that's part of the debate that's been taking place. One last thing, because I've written actually a lot on, on Jewish Americans in history, and I, and I think Jewish Americans provide another way of trying to measure whether uh, Israel remains a liberal state. I think Jewish Americans and Jewish Israelis are brothers from different planets. They were born in different neighborhoods. That matters. And we can see this in a variety of ways. We can see it in the way that Jews overwhelm, Jewish Americans overwhelmingly see themselves as liberals. This is not just about identity. This is about security. Jewish Americans are a minority. And there's no better protection of your minority status than through liberalism. I'm not sure that same imperative holds for Jewish Israelis who are in the majority. So maybe there's a security argument here. You know, we all know that Jewish Americans love Obama. Israel, Jewish Israelis, not so much. We all know that Jewish Americans hated Trump because he was authoritarian and he was, you know, he was a dog whistle for anti-Semitism. Yet Jewish Israelis seem to have, you know, idolized him, you know, in ways that most Jewish Americans don't get. Um, you know, and you have obviously the Netanyahu Trump romance, which, you know, actually can signal a lot to Jewish Americans. You know, so you began to see where a lot of Jewish Americans began to wonder whether, in fact, they had a friend in Israel. You know, and so you would begin to have, I think, you know, Difficulties between Jewish Americans and Jew and Israel, and that's deepened quickly, rapidly. Because you know what? One thing that Jewish Americans have a difficult time doing, is it comes up all the time in the United States, is how are you going to defend the occupation? There is, in a liberal society, there is no defense. It's a losing argument. And the occupation is the way that not just Jewish Americans, but a lot of Americans see Israel. And I would argue, make the case that they are different from us. They're not part of the liberal international order. So anyway, um, now you know why I should never have been this <laughs> So thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. It seems like a great moment to move to a question from the audience. Uh, we have time. Let's start with the first round. Yes, Benny. Yeah, great panel. Uh, and I agree with everything that was said. Apart from the fact that I think the most important uh, factor that uh, relate or at least influence Israel identity and its relation with the international order, as Michael said, we really exist uh, until the end of the Cold War or in the West. It's uh, the Israel security dependence on the, the, uh, the United States. So what that means? First of all, only due to this dependence, or at least mainly, Israel remain democrat democratic, even though we now can debate uh, to what extent Israel is democracy or not. I would predict, would predict that in the absence of America, dependence on America, Israel would not be a democracy long time ago before its occupation, just from the time it was born. Because actually, the time it was born, there was a very strong socialist, pro-Stalin camp in Israel that almost won the day at that time. Hard to believe. And it was only Ben Gurion that decided to go with America, and then America invaded different ways, the security umbrella. And that affected the but it also affected Jewish identity because first of all 
Jews in America, it was very important for them. Then later on, the evangelists became a very prominent and powerful political body in the United States. For them, it's very important that Israel will remain a Jewish state. So this are very uncomfortable and illiberal combination of a democratic state and a Jewish state is to a large extent a reflection of independence and the United States. So about the future, if Israel remains democratic or not, it really, even for the hard right, even though they are completely disconnected from the hard world, they are closed group in the, in the settlement and so on. So thus far it was Netanyahu that was leading the, uh, you know, the, 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 the government and he's fully aware of this, that there is no replacement to the security that they just, with all the respect to Poland and Hungary and all the, this illiberal state, they're not against. However, if the United States becomes illiberal, let's say next year, Trump wins the election, then obviously Israel will be the first one. Then the other for job, unfortunately, other liberal will become illiberal. But Israel will be the first to join the illiberal team. But so long the United States will be liberal, Israel will be maybe hardly, maybe not perfectly uh, a democracy because of security because it's a real politic factor. It's the existence of Israel depends on being democratic so long the United States is democratic. Because in the absence of American security umbrella, Israel cannot exist in the Middle East with all the occupation, with all the high tech, with all the IDF. So that means that kind of structure the two identities of uh, uh, this uncomfortable combination of these two uh, identities, competing identities of uh, Israelis dependence on the United States.
presumably that we are in the right you know, camp. Uh, if, you can, uh, if you can stick to that, uh, you know, maybe try to pinpoint in a sentence the origin of that uh, exceptionalism. <coughs> Civil war. 
It means that there is total uncertainty about our region, including Iran, etc. So. Okay, I received instruction from the leader of the international order, Galia, to, to stop the question and to start, uh, give time to comments. So we have, I think, like nine minutes for all, ten minutes for all of you to comment. Let's do the opposite direction. And you can also address other uh, presentation, and the floor is yours. Okay, so uh, I'm fascinated to hear this question about whether Israel needs the U.S. Uh, for some reason, I'm more bullish than you are. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it needs in the same way, but I also don't think that there's any danger of losing the U.S. anytime in the near future. Uh, there are going to be those who are going to talk about conditioning aid or reducing aid uh, that you know, I suspect very soon you'll find the U.S. no longer providing you know, the kind of protection that it does in the Security Council. I mean, I think there are ways in which you will now find, you know, signals. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, the domestic politics dimension, the role of the evangelicals in the U.S., you know, that's too important for understanding the nature of American politics. So, and, you know, as, as we have heard now from many uh, those who are in the Biden administration and those or is that, you know, in our terms of our article, there's great agreement with what we're saying, but they can never say it in public. And part of it is, if you said it, then you have to provide an alternative. And no administration wants to offer an alternative, not now. Maybe Clinton years before, but not now. And so, you know, and at the end of the day, this would just simply be a cost to anybody who's running for office if you were really sort of bringing the lever down on Israel. So I don't think that's going to happen. I do think that the question you raised, though, is, you know, this question about, you know, the U.S. And, and I would pose it in a different way, which is that the U.S. was an enabler. You know, when you talk about why the occupation not only lasted as long as it did, but also deepened, it's because the U.S., to give a, you know, it did sort of give a green light at various times. And I think part of the reason why there weren't sanctions is that you often heard in the U.S. that, you know, you can't really, you know, God forbid you sanction Israel because it could hurt the peace process. And, it came, and so you were going to basically hijack the occupation, sacrifice the occupation for the peace process, hoping that the peace process would in fact lead to the end of occupation. So that meant don't criticize Israel too much. You know, if you're going to private channels, not public sanctions. Um, and, you know, I think that's, well, even things like the settlements, you know, Israel would say settlements, I mean, America would say settlements are an obstacle to peace. They would never say it. They just, you know, wouldn't say it the other day. Settlements are a violation of international law and they constitute war crimes. American presidents won't say that. Uh, but so I think there's a way in which the U.S. has clearly enabled this. And, and by the way, I just want to sort of answer this question about uh, how the occupation has potentially affected, you know, Israel, 67, and the militarization. I just want to my, one of my favorite Israeli sociologists who I admired so much uh, and who I got to know better here when I was at Hebrew University is Baruch Kimberly. And I, I just, you know, his work and scholarship was pioneering and also in many ways quite courageous. So uh, that idea that, you know, you can't contain the occupation as if it's separate from Israel. It was always going to see that in different ways and different and corrosive ways. And I think that's part of what's going, you know, you tell me, I think that's part of what's going on in Israeli politics right now. It's, you know, a game of occupation, but also how that's linked to the rule of law. Yeah, regarding the question of the United States, uh, I, I, the question is not whether Israel can exist without the support of the United States. I agree, it cannot. 
The question is to what extent the United States can use the economic leverage to influence Israel uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think it reduced significantly in recent 20 years, and you can see that. So uh, in that sense, I, I do see a kind of divergence. I mean, if you compare the relationship between Rabin and Clinton, and the relationship currently between Netanyahu and Biden, I mean, it tells all the story. So obviously, the, the United States can, cannot use its economic leverage to prevent the settlements, for example. But I, I, I want to address a few issues, uh, Michael, about your presentation. I, I, I think you define, if I may say so, the uh, liberal order in a very idealistic terms. And you basically ignore the fact that this is, like I said, it's a power structure. Obviously, it's, uh, if you imply a very idealistic liberal criterion, so obviously Israel is not part of, but in that case, which country is part of the liberal? I mean, this is, <laughs> I mean, usually uh, the, the common argument is that the international liberal order started with in 45, and since then, I don't think any country would fit into the, this order if we accept this idealistic definition. Uh, so this would be an empty club. Um, and another point about Israel, I think, you know, one, um, it is a common argument that Israel is, has always been only partly democratic, which is maybe true, but I think in recent six months, we learned something. I mean, I, I learned, I mean, I was surprised by the capacity of the civil society in Israel to prevent uh, constitutional coup. This, I think this is unprecedented. It, it is unprecedented in Israel, I think even internationally, that uh, the civil society was, be and wh why, what was the source of power of the civil society? Basically, the civil society controlled a lot of the infrastructure, the technological infrastructure, the, the, the military infrastructure, this is in the end of the, uh, of the liberal democratic camp, which is smaller in terms of population, but it is much more powerful in terms of capital, infrastructure, etc., etc. So I don't know what is going to happen in Israel in the future, but I agree that Israel is not Turkey and it is not Hungary. Basically, Israel, the, uh, uh, its model of existence cannot survive an autocracy for a long time. Uh, not only because of the support of the United States, because of its, uh, uh, its economy. It is based, you know, all the economy is based on the 20% high-tech sector, which can go out from here. You cannot have a successful high-tech sectors in an autocratic country. Maybe there are exceptions, but as a rule, I, I think this argument holds. So it is going to be interesting, a very interesting here, uh, to see how the two, I would say, uh, I call it the Israeli of Tel Aviv and Israel of Jerusalem. Are, this is a kind of civil war between two types of Israel. And, but, you know, I always say that liberals tend to undermine their own power. And I, we, we see it in Ukraine and we see it currently in Israel. You know, the liberal camp is stronger than we anticipated.